that I get to talk to you about for a while is um, sharing your testimony, sharing your two or three minute testimony, what that can look like, um, and when you might be able to pull that out with someone. And so for some of you, this week has probably been maybe like me, where you're kind of all in. This is your gig. This is what you love, and it's easy to think about. And for other people, I've had some conversations, and last night I think a lot of the groups talked about some of the fears that come, um, hesitations and anxieties, and maybe that's you. This is new and you want it, but you're not sure how to get there. Um, and there's some trepidation about that. And if you are that latter, um, which I was, not very many years ago too, and, and I'm still that. I'm still nervous. I'm nervous now. Um, I told Pastor Eric, I, I didn't know you could pull your husband up with you <laughs> to be. So um, I still feel that way, but I've just allowed the Lord to stir my heart and get me so excited that I just push it down for what it can mean on the other side for somebody. And that's the fun part. Um, so I have some good news to start you with tonight if you're on sort of the new nervous anxiety end of sort of thinking about sharing the gospel more and more often in your life. And I want to share some information, some research with you from Lifeway Research in 2021. If we could put up that first slide um, for me, that'd be great. So here it is. 71% of people are open to hearing someone's life story. It's a lot of people. Because when we think about the postmodern Christian world, you hear a lot of things about how closed people are and about the walking wounded of the church. But 71% open to hearing your life story. 69% want to hear why someone thinks their faith helps them with a core human need. We're in. I read that and I'm like, okay. It may not sound, the sound beats of the narratives may not say that people are open. But people, people are open, they are searching. Um, hit the next one. 79% of unchurched Americans said that they don't mind a Christian talking about their faith. Most say they have multiple Christian friends, but those friends haven't shared why or how they should follow Jesus. That one's kind of sad, but it's also an energizer, right? It's also an energizer. And the truth is that we, that, that we know as the body of Christ is that the very large majority of us share the gospel with someone very, very seldom, if ever. That's the truth. Um, but it doesn't have to be the end, and that's why we're here, and, and that's really exciting. So I remember um, the first time that I saw these, and I thought, well, you know, this means that people who are longing will linger with you. That's what it says. That's what the research really says. People who are longing for something different will linger with you in conversation if you are taking an honest interest in them, asking good questions, um, and aren't afraid to enter in and engage. So... And the other good news for tonight is that you have many testimonies. We're going to talk about a two or three minute testimony tonight and how to share that. What I want you to hear from me is that you have many testimonies in different kinds. It may be your conversion story, that first moment. It may just be testimonies of God's presence, his power, his provision in your life. It may be another life change, a, a transition, a season where you really felt his presence and grew deep with him, right, and knowing his character fully in that moment. So there are lots of options as I talk about this two-minute testimony. Don't get caught up if you don't have that light bulb moment where God changed your life. Also, don't get caught up if you're that person that's been raised and you're in, in, the, in the faith of the Lord and you don't feel like you have a one moment that you've just always known he's there. Praise God for you. You don't need trauma and tattoos to have a testimony. It's great if you do. It's so great if you don't. If the, he has just been that steady in your life, celebrate that. I celebrate it with you. But you have some of these other God's presence, power, and provision testimonies to draw upon while I share this, this tool tonight. So, so I hope that works for you. When I first got excited about learning to share my testimony, it was because I was in this verse from Matthew. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. I thought, yeah, that sounds good. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed 
and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Broken, they were broken people. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And I was in a discipleship class when they taught this verse, and I remember it kind of mm, getting to me. I thought, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. The body of the Christ is the problem. <laughs> it's not the unbelievers. It's that the workers are few. And I took that to heart, and I thought, Gosh, Lord, show me. You know, break my heart for what breaks yours. You are Lord of the harvest. You're the Lord of every heart on the planet. And you're the one I get to ask to give me a new desire in my heart because our desires of our heart, they come directly from him. And so you're, we get to be free to say, hey, can you give me more of this desire to share the word? And I ask him because he's the one that can give it to me. And then he's the one that gives me my brave over and over again when I get opportunities. So I took that to heart and began to pray, and things happened. And I got more excited, and I started collecting tools. So um, I didn't want to be part of the problem. Paul says to proclaim the gospel, and I wasn't. So I asked the Lord to remind my heart. Not only I, I knew what Christ had done for me, I asked him to remind my heart of why I was glad he did it. I needed to have a little bit more celebration for what the Lord had done for me, which is my segue into how do we share our story? Because part of the parts of this are listening to someone else's story, listening really well, listening to understand, and then putting in just enough of our story, right, to lead them to God's story. It's kind of a three-part a three part deal, right? So we're right here tonight with how do you share your story is what I was asked to kind of play with tonight. And I'm excited about it. So I want to give you five tips for mapping out your story that I have found meaningful. And the first, um, you can go to that next slide. We'll work through the first three of these. The first one, be a blend of gratitude and authentic curiosity. Many people have problems hard, well, it's, find it difficult to transition to spiritual conversation with someone. I do too, sometimes. But what I have found is the better question asker I am, Jesus was a very good question asker. The better question asker I am, the conversation often leads to enough places where I can find a platform to jump off on, a transition to make. Um, so that authentic curiosity in someone else, hey, tell me more about that. What makes you believe that way? How did you arrive there? Can you tell me who you learned that from? Um, that's really interesting to me. I've never heard that before. Teach me more. I don't know about that faith. Tell me where you learned that belief. All of these questions that draw are the same questions that guide your conversation with someone. So become a good question asker. Ask permission. This is important. In those conversations, um, to remember that it's very honoring, it's very empowering, and it makes you a very safe person as you ask permission to engage someone about meaningful issues. So would you mind if I shared with you how I understand the gospel? Um, maybe you're talking about someone's brokenness. Um, hey, would you mind if I shared with you how I understand brokenness? And then you begin to tell the story of sin and the fall and that thing, however it leads. But um, to ask permission is meaningful. And I've learned to make that a habit with my children. I've learned to make that a habit with my husband at times. A lot of times I just bail right in with him. But, but I try to remember to ask, is this a good time <laughs> for? Um, when you tell your short story, your two-minute gospel, include the simplest gospel. And it's a go-go. If you go to the next um, slide, here's the simplest gospel. And this is just a... Um, a, a gospel guide that's easy to keep in your brain. Go, go. God's love, our problem. God's solution, our response. And if you can put your, your two-minute testimony and include those different pieces a little bit, um, you'll have the full, a full gospel and you'll point to the Lord the way that we should as we share our story. Because I, you know, to share our story is to share his story, right? We are his walking image. We are his walking billboard. Um, so... Here's the next one. Be brief. We're going to do that. Um, I'm going to, I think, example that. I think um, we have to be brief because you know our culture has become, is becoming, 
um, a, an audio-driven culture with a very short attention span, right? For a, a lot of different reasons, but media out, culture out there, church culture, we are all media-driven, and it's quick, and it's short, and it's changing our brains. <laughs> and so we need to develop um, a short, our short story, Be Brief. And E... Use feelings as markers. Sometimes I say, let feelings lead the way. And people kind of look at me and raise an eyebrow and go, feelings? Because feelings get a pretty bad rap in church culture, in the outer culture too. Um, Because we're not supposed to be led by our feelings. And we're not supposed to be led by our feelings. But God gave us feelings as warning lights. I guess, go to that next slide. Here's, the, what, here's what I want to say because we're going to use feelings in the model that I'm about to show you. And they're really important. One reason they're really important is because they are checkpoints. They're emotional checkpoints. Feelings are not the compass that we follow. Often in church culture, we, in fact, push feelings down because we are supposed to, you know, raise up our bootstraps and trudge through whatever hardship because we've got Jesus and he'll take care of me and I'm fine and and it's true he will be faithful but he has given us feelings as a response feelings are simply the indicator light what they indicate is where we stand in our understanding of our relationship to Jesus my anxiety my loneliness my anger my depression in part are warning lights and they are the indicators of where my my understanding of God's the way God sees me and my relationship with him does that make sense somebody nod okay yeah feelings do not define our value nor are they our true identity but they reflect relationship and proximity if that makes sense so they become really important so i want to give you a model um I'm going to put this up. Uh, don't get too lost in it yet. In fact, go back to the other one first. I th- well, no, it's okay. It's okay. Sorry. Just giving you a workout. <laughs> All right. Don't get too lost in it. I want to, we'll go to it in a minute, but uh, I think the best way for me to example the model is really to tell you my short story. And so I'm going to do that. And so. Um, here is my two-minute testimony and the story of me that sometimes I vary um, with detail or length depending on who and how the conversation is going. But I grew up knowing about God. I grew up knowing about Jesus as the Savior of the world and that he died for me. Um, I'm grateful for my parents for sharing with me the faith they knew. Uh, when I moved across the state to attend Hope College, though, um, my Christian foundation, as it turns out, was no match for the loneliness that I felt in that season. And in that loneliness, I made the decision to enter into a sexual relationship I thought would give me safety and identity and connection in that new space. Instead, my confidence, really my whole sense of self, was undone in that moment. And almost immediately, I felt disqualified from anything church or God. I had an immediate problem (laughs) because my way had gotten me lost and the shame that goes with selfish decision making had attached itself to me and kept blocking my way home back to what I knew before. Um, I felt lonely still, and now I felt embarrassed because I knew better. Um, I felt jealous of girls who looked like they had it all together. I think most of all, I felt stuck in a relationship trying to right a wrong because I knew that even if God still loved me, which I thought he might, I was pretty sure that he didn't like me very much anymore and that his affections were better spent on other people. And that is the play that is the rhythm of thought that I lived out of for a long time. God's solution for me, which comes from the truth of his gospel, found me through my older sister and a group of her friends that eventually became mine after I reluctantly accepted an invitation to a group one night where they had been faithfully praying for me 
did not know. Um, but later, a couple of them, as time went by, had some brave conversations with me about repentance and about grace and about life with Jesus. And before long, one night I found myself alone in my room in tears for hours, for hours, believing every word of it. I was captivated by God's gift of repentance and the truth that I was never good, never, and he is always good. And in that moment, I remember feeling a lot of things, feeling very, true, fully seen, fully seen, truly loved. And I remember feeling physically lighter, as if I had been emptied out of one thing and filled completely up with another thing, something better, something permanent. And I never looked back. I never looked back. Um, God calls me his beloved. That's actually what Amy means, beloved. Imagine that. He calls me chosen. He calls me a possession belonging to him. And that is the truth that I live out of now. I have peace. I feel it. Not the peace the world gives. I like what someone in my group said last night. She said, I don't have happy. I have joy. Joy is much more centered. makes a much better anchor. I feel hope. I have hope. I am hope. I call myself kind of a hope pusher for other people who feel stuck and disqualified. And what I have found are there, uh, for one reason or another, right? And what I have found and find often is that there are many, many people and there are many, many reasons, right? We all know them. We wrote them on the card last night. Which brings us back to having good tools and being ready to give an answer for the hope we have within us. And I'm so grateful. Gratefulness can, the posture of gratefulness can bring so much brave. If you wake up every day and say, Lord, thank you, thank you, it puts you in a posture of gratefulness and it, it makes you more watchful for opportunity to share Christ. It truly does. It's like a living thing that you can't explain. Anyway, so fl if you flip to the next thing of this, and these, these again are just a guide, but these are questions I came up with that sort of helped me fill in the feelings and the thoughts and the story behind them so that I could make that two minutes, so that I could be brief, but that my whole story was in it and God's story was in it too and that go-go was in it, right? God's love, our problem, God's solution, our response. And so what I did here, and this is, again, just, you don't have to use it, but if something about it is sort of clicks with you, snap it with your phone, I guess, and look at it later. But I filled in the parts of my story just to show you how it worked. So selfish decision leads to shame. Um, where was my security in the moment? What were the three feelings in the old, the before Christ, the before I really knew that it was mine to own? My three feelings, lonely, embarrassed, jealous, stuck. And sometimes when I ask people, and I did this in my breakout last night, after you tell your story, if you tell someone, if you ask, hey, do you remember any of the feelings that I shared in my before Jesus, life after Christ? They can usually pull them out. You know why? Because the feelings are what someone connects to. They may not identify with the individual circumstances of your story and we can get real lost in our big long stories because once we start telling it part of it's because we're not real practiced and we haven't sat down and narrowed in on it some of us are just long-winded some of us are just excited about well where we've been and what god's done whatever it is i i focus on the feelings as a starting point i pick three feelings for before when i encountered christ and life with Christ because the feelings themselves help me put a sentence or two on where those came from and it keeps it short. Maybe that's helpful for you. I hope it is. So I filled them in there. Um, my encounter with Jesus, what piece of God's gospel captivated me, the repentance, his, his love for me that way. The three words, beloved, chosen, treasure, felt seen, felt loved, felt lighter, felt full. 
And then finally, life in Christ. Um, what attitude, what attribute of God am I thankful for? His goodness, that fact that I always remember that when I found myself disqualified, it was because of something that I had done that made me not good, right? And the truth is, I was never good, and he is always good. That is the attribute that drives me, that I remember for other people, and then joy, steadiness, hope pusher. Helpful? Not helpful? It takes practice, it does, and it really does take writing it out, here it is. <laughs> And I, you know, I've written it out a few times over the years, but I find that people will listen that long to you. They will listen that long to you. And the, the idea that you are putting out to them is, you know, and you could even ask them, I felt so lonely in that place. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever experienced anything like that, a big transition that left you lonely? and looking for belonging, or whatever you, know, whatever you can pull out of that, you're asking them to identify with that feeling, and often they will. And what it does is it puts a little bit of a question mark in their mind of, boy, if, if she, if he felt that way, and I feel that way, and then this Jesus relationship happened, and she felt this, and now she, do, now she lives out of this kind of feeling, maybe that could be true for me, and I'm a little bit more curious about that, perhaps. And if it's God's time and if the Spirit's in it and if the Spirit's moving in them, then you may find some flow in that. So I offer that to you as, I don't know, something to take or not take. Um, the last thing up there is just practice, practice, choose. And it just, you have to practice it. You have to put on your brave and um, practice by yourself. <laughs> Write it out and read it and time it. It can be kind of fun. Practice on your kids. Practice on a believer. And then choose to pray for an opportunity when God can make you brave to try it in conversation with a non-believer. Um, I just have a quick conclusion. I might get us done early tonight. I don't know. <laughs> I have a quick encouragement is what I have. And so I sometimes read some stuff by this journalist in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, um, he, Michael, he, he's also the keeper of the archive for Bob Dylan, in case you're a fan, <laughs> which had nothing, one has not to do with the other. But he had this quote, and I found it, and I just liked it because it was another encouragement. It says, younger people are realizing that the current order of things being dictated by the media, by politicians, by celebrities, it's failing them. They're yearning for something else to center and to ground them. And we have it. And we have it. Amen. Amen. Um, so my last encouragement is something that I also throw out if this is new to you and you're just kind of starting on this prayer journey of wanting to share the gospel more often um, is something that I share from Zechariah 4.10. And it's not on a slide, but it goes like this. Do not despise small beginnings. For the Lord your God delights to see the work begin. Right? Do not despise small beginnings. Just get started. <laughs> so, that's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.